Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, January the 10th, 2013, and here are our top stories. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, our inside source confirms that Alex Jones was under active surveillance by the DHS during his trip to be on the Piers Morgan Show. Plus, you have been warned. Americans never give up your guns, so says the Russian site. Then, a prominent rifle manufacturer mysteriously dies days after posting psychiatric drug links to school shooters. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, when the British moved against the colonialists in uh, Concord to take their weapons, it caused the shot that was heard around the world. And when Piers Morgan moved to take our weapons, it caused the shout that was heard around the world. And i got to say, this is the first time I've been on the air since Alex had the uh, Piers Morgan interview, but I've never been more proud to work here. Uh, you know, it was, um, <clears throat> it was something that uh, uh, I've heard a lot of people do armchair criticisms of Alex, but uh, if, you ha if you're not in the arena, you just don't have anything to talk about. Look at what happened with the NRA. Was it a helpful thing for them to go silent for a week? Larry Pratt didn't, and Larry Pratt stepped into the, uh, uh, the arena, and he took some hits from Piers Morgan, but he held his own. In the same way, you know, people have criticized Ron Paul for not being forceful enough. They've criticized Alex Jones for being too forceful. But uh, I think when you're, when you're looking at uh, bullies, when you're looking at uh, people that are trying to take our fundamental rights, things that are given to us by God as human beings, ability to protect ourselves and our families, things that are recognized in the fundamental laws of our country, I don't think you can, uh, I don't think you can take that very uh, lightly. Um, I think it takes a strong response. You know, one of the first reports I did when I came here to InfoWars was talking about uh, uh, the EPA and things that were going on in the Smoky Mountains. And I recalled how I, I told my uh, children, read them the insert about how to handle wild animals, specifically bears. And uh, they tell you uh, not to run away from the bears, but rather to get in their face, to shout at them, to throw uh, bricks and stones, whatever you've got to throw it at him. And that's exactly what uh, Alex did. He went full auto on Piers Morgan, and uh, they just couldn't take it. Now, it's been confirmed that Alex was under active surveillance while he was in New York. Uh, in an interview today uh, on Alex's radio program with Doug Hagman, uh, he was told that uh, uh, a source within the Department of Homeland Security told Doug Hagman that uh, Several federal agents were assigned to follow Alex Jones during his visit to New York. They were told, bumper lock him. Make it obvious. Do whatever you can. Just make sure he knows. Handle him as a hostile. So I don't know how many uh, uh, agents were assigned to him, he said, and another fellow traveling with him, that would be Rob Dew. But I know that there was coordination between federal agencies and a private security concern. I've learned the assignment originated from pretty high up and was approved at multiple levels. This was supposed to be off the books, no records, and there was to be a complete denial if confronted, stated the source. Here's how Doug Hagman explained it on the Alex Jones interview earlier today. Your itinerary, Alex, your itinerary, as soon as you hit, the, as soon as the wheels were down in uh, New York, uh, you were under surveillance, active surveillance by uh, to at least two federal agencies, one of the two being the Department of Homeland Security. Three man teams of surveillance. Uh, in, now, we don't know how many, or I, I was not told how many total agents were involved in this, but you were under active surveillance. But not only just covert surveillance, because that, 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 that's normal surveillance. This was a bumper lock type surveillance. Now, I wrote a textbook on surveillance uh, that's used in, uh, for law enforcement training as well as uh, college uh, courses for Homeland Security. So I, I understand the different types of surveillance we're talking about, but bumper lock surveillance is where you make your presence known to the subject you're following. And the, the, uh, the words from my source were this, um, the instructions to the, the teams were bumper lock him, make it obvious, do whatever you can, just make sure he knows, handle him as, as, an, as a hostile, it, which tells me that they wanted you to know that you were being followed, at least during part of the operation. Now, from what I sense and, and what I had deducted from my conversation with my source, there were a couple of different operations going on here. The first of all was the the, the, the attempt to psychologically intimidate you uh, 
Now, from what I understand, and again, I don't know if you recorded it, I don't know what time, if it was live or whatever, but uh, some of this happened before, the surveillance happened obviously before the interview as well as after the interview. But the bumper lock type of surveillance of physical intimidation was especially before the interview. And I suspect that would, would be to destabilize you, to get kind of take you, keep you off guard. Um, and, and, and that's that's what that was. But you, you had three-man teams, actually, uh, three-man teams of operatives following you around. Now, the uh, the other part of this, uh, the other side of this story, and, and this is something that, that didn't shock me, didn't really surprise me, but, but alerted me. And I alluded to this in, in our interview the last time we spoke was you were going to be set up, Alex. That And, and that, that's the long and short of it. You were going to be set up. It, it's important that, uh, that, that, that you are to know that they, there was a woman by a Starbucks. And again, I don't know the geo. I mean, I, I don't know where you were. I don't know if you passed a Starbucks or if you're in the vicinity of one. But apparently, uh, you were to be accosted by or have some sort of physical altercation with a female at a, in front of or near a Starbucks. Now, I know that they're prolific in New York City. I guess it wouldn't be a stretch. But nonetheless, um, if one was close to the studio or your hotel or whatever, I would imagine, or however, you, you know, if you pass by one. With the intent, Alex, to make you look to embarrass you. In other words, this, and there was a video surveillance too. Let me just re reinforce that. In addition to the obvious overt bumper lock surveillance, there was a video surveillance. So the intent of this female was to, was to accost you in a, in a way that you would have to push her off or, or do something to get her away from you. That would then be on videotape or on, on disc, on security camera. Uh, covert surveillance taking or surveillance uh, footage taken covertly, and then used against you to marginalize you, to show that you were a violent man, to show that you were that you're out of control, and and, and the fact that it'd be a woman makes it even more hideous. Well, here's what Homeland Security needs to know: they're not going to stop Alex Jones by surveillance and intimidation. Or by dirty tricks, you know, uh, they'll probably say Alex was uh, paranoid, but it was Piers Morgan who said when he was in the UK that Tony Blair's wife was trying to get him killed. Uh, this is something we actually got on tape. And uh, we also have other sources telling us that this was a deliberate plan. But here's what you and the viewing public need to understand. And that is that you are being surveilled. You are being intimidated. You are about to be disarmed. And you need to stand up and say, this is it. We're going to not allow that to happen. We're going to draw the line in the sand. And that's exactly what Ron Paul said in an interview uh, with Alex Jones. We have this article on our site. It says, um, in it, Ron Paul said, I don't think the American people will turn in their guns, said Paul. He called it a line in the sand. And he said, if a federal agent marches in unannounced and they say, give me your gun, give me your gold, I don't think we'll do that calmly. I think the American people will highly resent it and resist, said Paul. Will you turn in your semi-autos? Well, uh, I might not even have anything to turn in for, uh, for that purpose, but uh, I don't think the American people will. I've always assumed that the line in the sand may well be drawn. Uh, if the federal agent marches in uh, unannounced and they say, well, give me your gun and give me your gold, I don't think uh, they will we'll do that, uh, you know, <laughs> calmly. I think the American people uh, will highly resent it and uh, resist. Do you, so you think I was right then telling Piers Morgan if they try to confiscate the guns, it will start 1776 Part 2? Well, I don't know whether I put them in the same words, but I think I said something very similar to what, <laughs> what you're saying. He pointed out the hypocrisy. He said, if the government kills our children, or kills children, rather, not our children, but other people's children, if the government kills children, it's okay? How many of them are shouting and screaming about the children that our drones are killing on a daily basis? Yeah, those are the drones that are under the command of Piers Morgan's best friend and good buddy, uh, Obama, as you see on the pictures that he likes to put on his uh, website and Twitter. Now, in another lesson from history, uh, Russians warn us, a Russian writer warns us, Americans never give up your guns. 
And he says in this, uh, he was a, his loyalties are essentially to uh, uh, the Tsarist Russians, the white Russians who fought the red Russians. He says, this well-armed population was what allowed the various white factions to rise up, no matter how disorganized politically and militarily, militarily they were in 1918, and to wage a savage civil war against the Reds. It should be noted that many of these armies were armed peasants, villagers, farmers, and merchants protecting their own. And if it had not been for Washington's clandestine support of and for the Reds, history would have gone quite differently. Now, one of the things I thought was interesting in his article was he says, and as for maniacs, whether it's nuts with cars, and he quotes, uh, you know, attacks in New York City and Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, that happened not too far from where I used to live. Uh, and in that situation, there was a, a crazy guy who uh, drove his car into a crowd of people. And, uh, you know, that was not reported very widely by the media. They didn't try to use that to ban SUVs, which is what he used. But, uh, you know, it was a devastating uh, attack nevertheless. Uh, and along those lines, uh, it's not only uh, Russians that are warning us to do that, but Americans in Wyoming, legislators, state legislators, are preparing to draw the line in the sand themselves. They're preparing to nullify any federal regulations that would ban semi-automatic weapons or high-capacity magazines because, quite frankly, those are unconstitutional. And anything that's unconstitutional, the federal government does not have the legal authority to do. So we're looking at another scenario here where state legislators are stepping into the uh, uh, brink here and doing what they're supposed to do, and that is exercising their Tenth Amendment rights. And we have a report on that from Aaron Dykes. Aaron Dykes for Infowars.com here. I'm going to make this as brief as I can. The state of Wyoming is introducing legislation this week for a Gun Protection Act, a bill that would uphold the Second Amendment and refuse to comply with any unconstitutional gun grabs. It would further make it a felony to try to enforce so-called laws or policies that violate the Second Amendment. And it would make any federal law banning semi-automatic firearms or limiting the size of gun magazines unenforceable. Now, now what's really exciting is this, this is the beginning of a slowly building movement gaining momentum. Last week we saw a police chief in a small town in Pennsylvania come on the air. He announced publicly he was going to introduce a second amendment protection ordinance that says no, we're going to nullify any unconstitutional gun laws and we will not enforce them within our boundaries. What I'm trying to do is have our council uh, in the borough of Gilberton uh, recognize the Second Amendment, stand behind the citizens of the United States and the Second Amendment, and uh, that they're not going to infringe on the Second Amendment uh, uh, regarding any state, local, or federal laws, rules, or regulations that may or may not come down. Now, what prompted you to do this? Everything that's going on right now uh, in Washington. States, local areas, counties, sheriffs, they all need to stand up and say no to violating the Constitution and Bill of Rights. It's our American heritage. It was put there by the founders for a reason. It's a, an attempt to have a check and balance against tyrannical government to keep one faction from getting too much power and using it as leverage over the rest of the country, the rest of the peoples. We must learn about nullification. It's upheld under the 10th Amendment of the Bill of Rights. It says that all powers not explicitly granted to the federal government are reserved to the states and to the people. And that's exactly what we need to recognize and uphold. We need counties, states to say no. We're not going to violate the Second Amendment, and we're not going to cooperate with the feds. We need people to be patriots and stand up and be firm on this issue. And if enough people do that in enough areas throughout the country, the feds will recognize, the Washington lawmakers will recognize that they've gone too far, and they will back off from their attempts to curtail and outright violate and ban the Second Amendment. If we do that, we could stop this thing peaceably. We don't want a civil war in this country. And so we hope this kind of legislation at whatever level of government will spread virally throughout the country. You need to call your state lawmakers where there's still a lot of constitutionally minded people in those positions. You need to call your cities and try to influence them to do this. It'll, of course, be harder in the mega cities and the big urban areas, but especially in the rural areas where people still understand what this country's about. We need to make that message loudly resounded. We need to educate people about the Bill of Rights and Constitution 
description and what is nullification. I recommend checking out Infowars.com as well as places like the 10th Amendment Center. Let's do this, people. We can turn this thing around before it's too late. Signing off for Infowars.com. And let's remember when we talk to our elected representatives, our federal congressmen, let's remember that the Second Amendment isn't just about wholesale gun confiscation. Even if they stop short of that, if they infringe upon the right of the people to keep and bear arms, that is still breaking the Second Amendment. And we need to not fall for any kind of, uh, you know, Feinstein is the master of uh, misdirection and head fakes. Uh, what I'm very concerned about is the UN authorization of uh, the UN uh, Treaty for Arms Trade. And uh, that is something that could quite frankly be a precursor to full-blown confiscation if they're not able to get it through at this point in time. I mean, if they can get it through, I'm sure they'll go for it. But I think what we're seeing here is a frontal attack. And for the first time, they're openly talking, uh, everyone is openly talking about confiscation, not just a few people like Feinstein or Obama, but pretty much across the board, we see calls for that and uh, open confiscation. But they've also got uh, more than one front that they've got planned. And uh, the UN ATT is going to be coming up again in March. And uh, that's going to be something where if they're successful in the name of stopping arms trade across borders, they're going to be looking to register and identify guns to a far greater extent uh, than they've ever done before. And that could be the actual precursor to full-blown confiscation. We don't want to think that we've won a victory uh, if we just get a few more laws put on us and a few more of our uh, freedoms, basic freedoms infringed upon, and they stop short of total confiscation because that is their ultimate goal. We actually need to roll back unconstitutional infringements on our right to keep and uh, bear arms. Now, uh, Piers Morgan would like you to think that uh, once they enacted a total gun ban in Britain, it created something of a Pax Britannia. But nothing could be further from the case. Uh, it's an article that's about three years old now, but uh, things have not improved in the intervening three years. In uh, the Daily Mail, a Brit British newspaper, it says a culture of violence, gun crime, goes up by 89% in a decade. And what they're pointing out in this three-year-old article that was in the first decade after a total gun ban, uh, firearm offenses actually increased from 5,209 in the 1998-99 period to 9,865 10 years later. That was an 89% increase. Sorry, Piers. 89% increase in gun violence in Britain after they confiscated the guns. And in 18 areas, gun crime at least doubled. Uh, it says in the article, Lancashire suffered the single, single largest rise in gun crime with recorded offenses increasing from 50 in 98 to 349 in 2007 and 2008, which is an increase of 598 percent, 598 percent. And it says a number of people injured or killed by guns, the number of people rather, killed or injured by guns, has increased from 864 in 98 to a provisional figure of 1,760 in the 2009 reporting period. Now, if you haven't seen Piers Morgan's second interview with Larry Pratt, which was on uh, CNN last night, uh, you have to take a look at that because this time, Musket Morgan flies into a rage. Now, he started out the program by saying, uh, thanks for coming on a second time, and last time you were on the program, this is what you made me do. And he actually showed the... Uh, the clip where he starts uh, screaming at Larry Pratt and uh, with uh, kind of infantile elementary school uh, epithets, you know, calling him a stupid, stupid man, silly stuff like that. Uh, but, um, you know, and in the, in the, uh, there was fireworks again last night in the interview uh, when Larry Pratt started to point out that the gun statistics that England keeps are not very accurate. Uh, the Daily T uh, Telegraph has pointed out that, among other things, Gun crimes in Britain are not counted as gun crimes if a gun is not fired. So if someone is robbed at gunpoint, it's not a gun crime, according to the UK statistics, if the trigger is not pulled. If a woman is raped at the point of a gun, it's not a gun crime as long as the trigger is not pulled. And they estimate that uh, it's 60% higher than reported. Now, i got to tell you personally, I've been to London four times in the last 40 years. I've stayed there from anywhere from three days to six weeks was the longest stay that I, t I stayed there. And from the 70s and 80s, when you had bobbies who were walking around in pairs, 
unarmed or riding bicycles or whatever. And they, they were actually doing street patrols, which our police in big cities used to do when they were first created. But in the intervening years, what they've done is they've disarmed the population. When I went back in 2001, they had disarmed the population and they had armed the police. And they had taken them, from what I could tell, I didn't see anybody walking beats. They had them in cars. So they've gone to an American style of law enforcement where the police are distant from the, the people who live there and they're distant from the crime that affects people. And uh, that's reflected, you, you could really feel it in the attitudes of the people on the street from uh, the early uh, 1980s until 2001, from the 70s when I was there. Uh, and that's what these, these crime statistics uh, uh, bring out. And, and I gotta say at the, at the bottom of that article, that last article we had, there was a video that you really need to take a look at. It's, it's by a guy, it's called uh, Amidst the Noise, is his Facebook handle. And he did an excellent job of looking at the statistics behind this. And uh, what, he, what he showed was how uh, crime has changed in both countries. And with the violent crime decreasing radically in the United States, he asked, why are no politicians taking credit for this? There's been a 50% reduction in violent crime and in murder over the last 20 years, you would think that politicians would be lining up to take credit for that. I mean, they're taking credit for it in England, even though it's not true, right? But uh, it's much more important for them, I think, to create fear. And he also points out that if you look at the data, the FBI, and he went to the FBI website and, and looked at the actual uh, raw data that they have there, and sorry, peers, but that's exactly what it says. Uh, he points out that um, if you're looking at it, the FBI keeps these statistics on a geographical basis. As he points out in the video, urban hotspots are a big part of the uh, crime. As a matter of fact, where most of the crime is uh, centered. And it's in those areas that we've seen an increase. So if the government really wants to do something about crime, which even though they're not really addressing the serious root causes of crime or really doing anything effective about it, because overall it's dropped 50%, but in these urban areas, these hot spots, it's actually gone up in the places where they've done the most to try to control guns. That clearly isn't the way to reduce violent crime. Now, as we said, the problem is not guns, but it's suicidal shooters. It's suicidal people with automobiles or with guns or with hammers or whatever. And we need to ask the question that Alex asked Piers, and that is, what makes uh, these suicide, what are the links to these suicidal shooters? And of course, uh, Alex brought that up, but he didn't get any response from Piers Morgan. Now, Mike Adams of Natural News did look into this carefully, and uh, so did somebody else who uh, is no longer around. A prominent rifle manufacturer posted a detailed link connecting psychiatric drugs to school shooters. This guy died in a mysterious car crash days after the posting. And uh, Mike Adams points that out and he says, uh, sure, that could be uh, a coincidence. It might also be a coincidence that Feinstein just happened to have a detailed gun confiscation bill ready to release following the Sandy Hook shooting. It might also be a total coincidence that according to Google, the United Way Sandy Hook donation support page was created on December 11th, 2012, a full three days before the shooting. It could also be a coincidence that NBC reported Adam Lanza's AR-15 rifle was left in his car, never used in the shooting at all. It could also be a coincidence that Bank of America slammed home an economic embargo against online gun parts retailer in the days following the Sandy Hook shooting. It could even be a coincidence that Facebook suspended or shut down the accounts of hundreds of prominent people who advocated the Second Amendment, including our accounts at Natural News, he says. And finally, it could be a total coincidence that police radio recordings seem to indicate that there were multiple shooters, multiple shooters involved in Sandy Hook. What are the odds of all of these coincidences existing simultaneously? Virtually zero. Well, Melissa Melton noticed that the term that Alex used when he talked about pharmaceuticals involvement in making people suicidal, the term he used was mass murder pills. Uh, she noticed that that was trending on Twitter. Uh, so to explore that further, she wrote an article and we've got uh, Melissa right here in the studio right now. Well, Melissa, what are mass murder pills? Well, that actually is a question I decided to look up because after Alex was on Pierce Morgan, that began trending on Twitter. The fact that he said that he wanted to blame the real culprit in these shootings was the suicide pills, the mass murder pills, and CNN even decided to mock him in an article they posted yesterday mentioning that that was a big conspiracy. But let's look at a few facts first because 
I, what I found was actually pretty disturbing. Americans actually consume more psychotropic drugs than any other nation in the entire world. That's first. Mm -hmm. Secondly, antidepressant use has risen in this country by 400 percent just since wow. 1988. Wow. So it's a lot of people. Um, current figures that I saw, it's one in 10 Americans or 11 percent of Americans over the age of 12 are now on these kinds of drugs. And the side effects, let me just listen, list some of these side effects for you because it's, it can be pretty scary here. Confusion, hallucinations, anxiety, agitation, mood swings, impulse control disorder, paranoia, psychosis, and hostility. And a Canadian judge even recently ruled that a 15-year-old boy who stabbed one of his friends uh, did that largely because he was on Prozac. Mm. So a Canadian judge recently ruled these drugs can actually cause children to commit murder. Wow. And in 2007, the FDA voted to update the black box warning on these antidepressants because they found in their own studies that young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 were committing suicide in much higher numbers than other people on these drugs. So they wanted to inc include increased warnings about that. Mm -hmm. And a black box warning is like the strongest warning that the FDA can give actually a drug. And so I decided to look into that even further now in relation to these mass shootings. Mother Jones website actually prepared a list of data from 1982 to 2012 of these mass shootings and of 62 of them carried out by 64 shooters, a majority of them had mental health issues. 41 shooting of the shootings involved mental health issues and mental illnesses and seven more that were listed as unclear had family members who said that they had mental health issues or were on medications. So it was a pretty high number of them that had these kinds of issues. And as Dave Kuplian reported for WND, there's a gaping hole in media reporting on Sandy Hook because Quote, it is simply indisputable that most perpetrators of school shootings and similar mass murders in our modern era were either on or just recently coming off of psychiatric medications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. And another study done in 2010, actually, of the top 10 legal drugs that are linked to violence, five of them were antidepressants and another two of them were for ADHD. Mm -hmm. So seven out of the 10 were these types of drugs. Oh. And you had just mentioned the story from Mike Adams from Natural News. Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. He was posting that, writing that, I guess, right at the same time that I was working on this. And uh, John Noveski posted that list on his Facebook of, of over 40 incidents where primarily young people committed murder or suicide while on these types of medications. And as you recall, the FDA warning that I just mentioned, that was for that same age group. And the majority of the people on this list were of that age group. And I just want to read a few that I was able to go and verify mm -hmm. from his list. Eric Harris, age 17, first on Zoloft, then Lovix, and Dylan Klebold, age 18, committed the Columbine Littleton, Colorado shooting. They killed 12 students and one teacher and wounded 23 others before killing themselves. Klebold's medical records have not been released, so we don't know if mm -hmm. he was on something or not. Jeff Weiss, age 16, had been prescribed 60 milligrams a day of Prozac, which apparently is three times the average starting dose for adults. When he shot his grandfather, his grandfather's girlfriend, and other fellow students at his school, uh, Corey Badsgard was 16. He was at Waluke High School. He had taken Paxil, other reports say affects her, when he took a rifle to his high school and held 23 of his classmates hostage. He reportedly had no memory of that after it happened. Christopher Pittman, age 12, murdered both his grandparents while taking Zoloft. Kip Kinkle, age 15, was on Prozac and Ritalin when he shot his parents while they slept, then went into his school the next day and opened fire on his classmates, killing two and injuring another 22, and that was right after he started his Prozac treatment. Uh, Jeffrey Franklin of Huntsville, Alabama, was on Prozac, Ritalin, and Klonopin when he took an axe and murdered his parents and then went after his siblings. Mm -hmm. And that's just a few wow. that I was able to verify. As you know, this list, this is part of that list. Here's another part of that list. And as Noveski's post ended, he asked, what drugs was Jared Lee Loeffner on, age 21, when he killed six people and injured 14 in Tucson, Arizona? What drugs was James Holmes on, age 24, when he killed 12 people and injured 59 in Aurora? What drugs was Adam Lanza on, age 20, when he killed 26 and wounded two in Newtown, Connecticut? All within that same age range. Mm -hmm. And I decided to even try and look into it further, and I found a website called SSRI Stories, and I found this. <laughs> and wow. My computer shut down twice trying to print this. What this is is 110 pages of stories from all over the world of people that have been on these drugs and either committed a mass murder, 
a homicide, a suicide, they've self-harmed or they've threatened to kill people on these drugs. And this first page here is all just school incidents. Wow. And it's not just shooting. Some of these are knifings. There's a machete attack on here. Wow. So, yeah. That's the thing. I mean, we could take people's guns away, but if we don't address the root causes of a lot of these things, and that is psychotic behavior, uh, people are going to use anything, including cars. I mean, you can kill mass amounts of people with a car driving it or through a crowd. Or a knife or a uh, hammer. Or... That's right. Exactly. That's right. But the correlation here cannot be overlooked, and the mm -hmm. mainstream media is not talking about this. So mm -hmm. while they're quick to judge Alex for what he said, they need to actually go and take a look at this. But mm -hmm. instead, they're just jumping right on our Second Amendment, trying to take away our rights, pretending like these are isolated incidents. This, exactly. this is not an isolated incident. Right. It, it, it needs further study. So. And all Alex had time to do was just to interject that in as a term because they had strict, exactly. you know, they, he wasn't going to be given a chance to talk. If he didn't shout at peers, he wasn't going to be given a chance to talk. And certainly in the allotted, even if it had been a civil discussion in the allotted time that they had, they weren't going to have enough time to talk about well, this time Well, you've seen how connection. Pierce treated Larry Pratt when he oh, tried yeah, to be absolutely. civil yeah. about things. Oh, absolutely. Just, it doesn't work. Well, CNN is not going to uh, talk about their one of their biggest corporate sponsors, and that's the big pharmaceutical companies. Of so, uh, not. and they're not going to take a look at uh, gun crime that's in uh, the large cities. But uh, the, the whole point is that the mainstream media is trying to create an atmosphere of fear. They're trying to get people afraid so that they'll run to the government for protection and give up their rights, give up anything that they've got in order to have a sense of security. And that was another thing that Alex referred to very briefly when he talk, started talking about uh, sharks. Uh, of course, he didn't have time to, to flesh that out. But, you know, it, it's the, the whole idea is the irrational fear of sharks, largely created by uh, Jaws, other movies, and the media. Uh, every time somebody gets bitten by a shark, it's international news. Uh, but there, your chances of dying by shark bite are extremely rare, even if you're swimming somewhere where there are sharks. Uh, but it's all about creating a climate of fear. And uh, to counteract that climate of fear, a couple of guys uh, in their early 20s, two men armed with rifles, did a walk through Portland in order to educate the people. And it's kind of interesting, these two young guys went around and they, they slung a couple of rifles over their backs and they uh, walked around Portland, Oregon, and the calls to 9-11 started coming in fast and furious to the police. And when they went out there, they found these two concealed carry permits, uh, carrying their rifles openly on their backs, and uh, they were telling, they told the officers they were just trying to educate people about exercising their gun rights. Now, what one of the guys said was what they really wanted people to do was to look at the person, to determine if the person was acting aggressively. And that's the whole point, isn't it? I mean, it's not the guns. The guns don't, uh, are not going to fire themselves, as Mike Adams uh, cleverly pointed out in a very funny piece where he threw the gun on the ground and ordered it to shoot, ordered it to kill. It didn't do anything. Uh, their point, and they made it very well, was that we've gotten to the situation where people are just afraid of the appearance of guns. I mean, they call them assault rifles. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, that's a very vague term. It doesn't really mean anything except that it's a rifle that looks scary. And even the appearance of a rifle is scary. So what he's saying is, look at the person, see if they're acting aggressive before you dial 911. Well, we had a couple of our own guys, uh, Jakari Jackson and uh, David Ortiz, walk around Austin. Uh, they weren't carrying guns, they were carrying cameras, and they wanted to see what people thought about the Second Amendment. Here's that report. Not only talk about voting no on some of the legislation that is loosening up. I'm here to not only talk about voting no on some of the legislation that is loosening up uh, registration and re-registration of gun owners, but more importantly, to ban all assault weapons. An assault weapon is a weapon full automatic. It is allowed only the military and the police. It's only for the military and police and for a special uh, uh, trust where you can get where you can buy a class free weapon. I don't think that taking away a person's right to bear arms is the answer, but I do believe that there should be restrictions. I have a clean record, so technically I could go to a gun show and purchase as many guns as I want to, have them in my house. I have a four-year-old daughter. 
Why should I have an assault rifle? A gun show, a shooting range. You never see mass shootings there. There's all kinds of ammo and guns and people walking all around them. Yeah, I don't support the assault weapon ban. What I do believe is a good alternative would be like my, my colleague here mentioned is a uh, uh, strong restrictions when it comes to evaluating the people's uh, mental health, psychiatrist exam or something. Now what about in China where a gentleman, I believe it was around the same time, slashed 20 children with a knife? What do you say to people who may bring that up? Well, I can tell you that I'm a citizen of America and in America we're a civilized people and as civilized people we need to set our own rules in place to govern our country. What did you say to people who say, well, maybe the Sandy Hook guy had a gun, but this guy had a knife? A person with a knife is a lot easier to subdue. What do you think about gun-free zones at schools? Oh, free massacre zone. Oh, say the principal had, had a gun in her office. Would she have had time to even pull it out, take off the safety, and use it? Um, and, and to that extent, so I don't think that's a good argument. How long did they have to wait till someone got there to stop this guy? Right. Because no one in this quote-unquote safe school zone or no gun zone was there to defend the children. Obama's kids, they go to a school with 11 guards. Now, besides assault weapons, are you for any other type of legislation such as uh, banning uh, high-capacity magazines or certain types of ammunition, anything like that? Yes, but I, I think the core of it is to get rid of the weapons. People say they don't want you to have more than 10 rounds in your magazine. You know, it, it's just another incremental step. I mean, okay, is it 10 rounds today? Is it five rounds next week? One of the alternatives I really, really would push for would be raising the price on bullets. Raising the price on bullets, raising the taxes on bullets. Okay, you realize that a deer rifle or an AR-15 are basically the same thing, just one looks spookier than the other? Well, it should be a weapon that shoots one bullet at a time. The federal government recently just spent, you know, just purchased 1.6 billion. I believe it was in the past calendar year. Well, if it's the federal government purchasing it, then it's, it's probably going to go to our law enforcement. And I think that's something that the, our law enforcement people need. Uh, not too long ago, the Empire State Building, where the police opened fire on one guy and hit eight or nine other people who were not their intended target. So, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, we can uh, have no comment on that. Don't you want to defend yourself against tyranny? Yes, Somebody sir, I do. that wants you put down like this, wants you make you a slave? Isn't that the freedom of the Second Amendment? Now, as far as the Second Amendment, it has the right to a well-regulated militia. Do you think a well-regulated militia could use something like assault weapons? And the Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. And it also know. has for a well-regulated militia. That's, that's also in there as well, Miss. Well, it's our military is our militia, not our common, everyday citizens. Now, sir, there are people out there that say, why do you need a semi-automatic rifle such as the one allegedly used in the uh, Sandy Hook shooting? Well, just once again, it's, it's not about my need. It's about my right. Please Miss, if I can something. ask you a question talking about the blood of children on our hands, uh, the Obama administration, and it went back to Bush as well, had something called Operation Fast and Furious where they gave fully automatic weapons to Mexican drug cartels. Now, they said it was a sting operation, but it was used to kill a Border Patrol agent, policemen, as well as other children. Do you think we should, anybody should be held accountable for that? Okay, I'm not going to comment on no. that. When seconds count, police are only minutes away, and I carry a 1911 because the policeman's too heavy. Well, as you can see, there's a lot of different opinions about the Second Amendment, about uh, the right to keep and bear arms. And it reminds us that this debate is something that we all need to take place in, uh, take part in. It, it's not something, if we just leave this to the mainstream media, uh, we're going to lose this. We all have to get involved. We all have to be informed. And we have to inform those people that we come in contact with, that, we, uh, that are in our family, our circle of friends. Uh, now, that leads us to one of our quotes today from John, uh, John Adams. He said, I always consider the settlement of America with reverence and wonder as the opening of a grand scene and a design in providence for the illumination of the ignorant and the emancipation of the slavish part of mankind all over the earth. That, folks, is what we're fighting for when we fight for our liberties. And we're going to go to break, but right after we come back from break, we've got an interview with Francis Boyle. Now, Francis Boyle is a real civil libertarian and a lawyer. And we're going to talk about Alan Dershowitz, who just plays one on TV. And uh, after that interview, we've got to stay tuned because we've got an interview. Uh, Rob Dew is going to talk to Professor James Tracy, uh, who's come under fire for some of his comments about Sandy Hook. 
Northwoods, Gulf of Tonkin, Gladio, Kent State, Ruby Ridge, Waco, Oklahoma City, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, Shanksville, Hurricane Katrina, Fast and Furious, Fast and Furious, Fast and Furious, how many more? How many more? How many more false flags? How many more? How many more government buildings? How many more innocent people? How many more? How many more? What has been the number one cause of unnatural death in history? Democide, or death by government, has killed 290 million people on record. 290 million people killed. Killed. 290 million. Killed by government. The government. The number one killer in history is democide. 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 Death by government. Look it up. Go look it up. In the 20th century, government murdered four times as many people as were killed in all the international and domestic wars combined. USSR, 61,911,000 people killed. Hitler's Germany, nearly 21 million people killed. Japan's imperialism, nearly 6 million people killed. Western colonization killed over 50 million people. Pol Pot's Cambodia, funded by the U.S. government, 2 million people killed. China's Communist Party, as many as 76 million people killed between 1949 and 1987. And the list goes on and on. So now you know the most dangerous thing to you and your family in the world is government. Because mass murderers agree. Gun control works. Disarming citizens is democide. Disarming citizens is democide. Disarming people is democide. How many people have died because of Fast and Furious? No more false flags. Enough. Enough. It's enough. Now is the time. It's time. It's time to realize that when the government takes your guns, people die. It's time to realize the biggest threat to you and your family is government. It's time to recognize government is the greatest killer of all time. It's time. Demand a plan. Demand. Demand a plan. Demand a plan right now. As a free human being. As an American. As an American. As an American citizen. As a patriot. For your children. Demand to know why you and your children are forced into gun-free zones while government officials, celebrities, and their children are protected by armed guards. Demand they show you the word hunting in the Second Amendment. Demand to know why the government shipped thousands of guns to Mexican drug cartels. Demand our government stops blowing up federal buildings. Demand that our troops stop protecting opium fields in Afghanistan and come home. Demand the government stop this phony drug war. Demand to know why the Department of Homeland Security bought more than 1.6 billion hollow point bullets with our money. Demand our government stop poisoning our food supply with genetically modified organisms. Demand that President Obama stops killing innocent women and children all around the world with his illegal drone attacks. Demand an end to these unconstitutional wars. Demand that the TSA stop groping our genitals at the airport. Demand that the NSA stop illegally spying on all of us all the time. Demand that toxic fluoride be removed from the water supply. Demand our politicians uphold the Constitution and Bill of Rights as they swore to when they took office. It's time. It's time for our leaders to act like Leaders. It's time for our leaders to read the Constitution. It's time for our leaders to obey the Constitution. The Constitution. The Constitution. Because a well-regulated militia with 10-round magazines wouldn't last very long. Demand an end to citizen disarmament. Government-sponsored terror. And democide. Democide. Death by government. Right now. Right now. Right now. We are sick and tired of our tyrannical government taking away our rights. Stop stealing our rights. Our rights. Our rights. How many more people does government have to kill? Enough. Enough. Enough already. Enough. 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 Enough of the people laying down and letting government kill them in mass after disarming them as they've done throughout history over and over again. Enough, enough to laying down and letting these criminals use us up like slaves.
Christy Hightower here with a quick Planet and Fours update. Good to see you all, Patriots, again. Uh, you're still talking on the site, and we're still listening. And I just wanted to give you a quick little um, intro, I guess. There's a letter to peers. Obviously, as you've all known, it's all across the media. Everyone's talking about Alex's V. v Pierce. Uh, somebody wrote a letter to Pierce, and it, it goes something like, I was glad to see you maintain the famous Brit civility. That was refreshing. Now, before everybody overreacts, he goes on to say, fact remains, the dictatorship that is being imposed is by no means civil. When countries are taken over by dictators, good people die. So go and finish reading that. I, I found it really interesting because when it first when I first started reading it, that first sentence kind of made me mad. I think Piers is a, a you know, British, he, he ran away from some bad stuff, so he really shouldn't even be here, in my opinion. But then he goes on to just explain, like, hey, Piers, you're, you're taking in on a one side, so go and read it, uh, leave your comments below, and uh, I'll look forward to reading those. And the next two things I just wanted to give you an update about, we have two different missions. Now, all of the groups on the site, I'm sure, have their own missions, but we have one for the Dating Freedom Lovers with uh, February 14th coming up. Obviously, um, we want to make sure you guys find love or maybe have the option at least. So th these two people, Eric and Samantha, uh, are doing really well. I've been in touch with them. And what we're going to start doing is if you send us your picture and a quick little bio, now obviously nothing too vulgar, you know, like, come on, keep it decent, but uh, if you send us your picture and a little bio, we're going to feature you in that top section where you just saw their picture. And if we get enough of them, we'll trade them out like every day or even every hour if we have that many. So just send them on in and uh, we'll post those up. That's one mission. You can find that in the Dating Freedom Lovers group. Uh, Patriots, y'all are talking, and again, we're listening. Thank you for all you're doing. Well, when Alex Jones was on the Piers Morgan show Monday night, the third segment was supposed to be a debate with Piers Morgan and Alan Dershowitz against Alex Jones. Now, even with a stacked debate like that, they decided that they didn't feel comfortable having Alex represent himself. And that really shouldn't be surprising for anybody that knows the history of Alan Dershowitz. He, even though he's billed as a lawyer, a civil liberties lawyer, and even though he is a Harvard law professor and a darling of the mainstream media when it comes to getting legal sources, Alan Dershowitz has exhibited over time a real antipathy towards people getting their due process or even hearing out the other side. Uh, he's put out as a civil libertarian, as a legal expert, but, uh, you know, a, a Stanford article, interestingly enough, back in um, a few years ago when he was talking about torture immediately after 9-11. They quoted this and they introduced him this way. They said, Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz, one of the country's leading civil libertarians, suggests creating a mechanism where U.S. judges could approve domestic torture warrants if they're convinced such tactics could thwart an imminent attack. Now, I don't know how you'd call somebody that advocates something like that a civil libertarian, but we have somebody here who is also a Harvard Law School graduate who is an international lawyer and who really is a civil libertarian. We have Francis Boyle on the line and we're going to talk to him about uh, some of uh, Alan Dershowitz's uh, perspectives and see who's a little bit more dangerous, whether it's Alan Dershowitz or Alex Jones. Francis, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me on in my uh, best your listening audience. <laughs> what, what did you think the other night about uh, the, uh, what, what Alan Dershowitz said about Alex Jones uh, being somebody who was dangerous and an exhibit of somebody who ought to have their guns taken away? Well, first, I thought it was completely unfair that uh, the uh, Brit twit nitwit uh, Pierce Morgan did not permit uh, uh, Alex to debate Dershowitz as the uh, event had been uh, billed and putting aside the fact that it was all stacked against uh, Alex. Second, uh, Dershowitz's call for um, uh, Alex to be stripped of his guns clearly violated uh, the Second Amendment, the Fifth Amendment uh, due process clause, 
and uh, effectively uh, could constitute a bill of attainder uh, against Alex uh, in violation of the Constitution if Congress uh, uh, or the president uh, were, were to do something like that uh, uh, directly. Uh, fourth, um, Dershowitz is well known in the uh, legal profession, indeed uh, notorious, as the uh, foremost uh, advocate for torture. Mm -hmm. So in uh, watching uh, Dershowitz's uh, comments, I thought, oh, sure, he's happy to strip uh, uh, Alex of, uh, of his guns in violation of the Constitution and then uh, torture Alex for uh, disagreeing with him on this and uh, other issues. No, yeah. no problem with that. Exactly. There was an article, you mentioned torture. There was an article uh, that uh, Dershowitz wrote called uh, Make Torture an Option. Let me just read a, a quick quote here from that. He says in it, the real debate is whether such torture should take place outside our legal system or within it. The answer to this seems clear. If we're to have torture, it should be authorized by the law. <laughs> does, does that make it morally or ethically right to uh, authorize it by the law? Well, it can't be authorized by the law. I mean, it's it, it preposterous, and um, uh, Dershowitz uh, uh, knows it. He's just advocating uh, torture and aiding and abetting uh, and, and encouraging uh, torture. Uh, this is well known. Uh, and basically, uh, any law professor uh, advocating torture is a disgrace to my uh, profession. Yes. And right now, you have uh, six of them on the uh, faculty at Harvard Law School, including uh, Dershowitz. One final point I wanted to make uh, about this matter is that uh, we all know uh, uh, Morgan is, is sort of a de facto uh, uh, agent of the British government, the British Empire. Alex mm -hmm. took care of that. What people don't know about uh, Dershowitz uh, is that he works for the Israeli government. So you had two foreign agents uh, yes. on that uh, program uh, against Alex, uh, the patriot, standing up for the Constitution. Dershowitz admitted publicly that he is a member of a Mossad committee that approves the assassination of Palestinians which is a war crime uh, in its own right. Mm -hmm. So basically, he works with and for the Israeli government. So uh, effectively, Alex uh, was sort of like Daniel going into the lion's den there, mm -hmm. debating uh, one agent for the uh, British government and uh, another agent for the uh, Israeli government and standing up for the uh, United States Constitution. That, that was my thought, and, and I did want to uh, uh, make this point. And in fact, uh, you know, I've locked horns uh, repeatedly with uh, Dershowitz. He, he does the uh, legal hatchet work here uh, in the United States for the, uh, for the Israeli government and has done that since uh, Gene Rostow died, his predecessor, uh, who is at the uh, uh, Yale Law School, and I locked horns and debated uh, with Rostow uh, before uh, before Dershowitz. So um, we had two foreign agents there that uh, Alex was uh, uh, up against. Yes, yes. And, and before we leave, before we leave the... It's uh, an American citizen and a law professor who, who has taken an oath to uphold the uh, Constitution of the law of the United States. I, I simply uh, wanted to... Uh, stand up with Alex against these these two foreign agents, as, as I see it. Thank you. Thank you. appreciate that. I appreciate you know, standing up against things like torture. Listen, this is from uh, March 4th, 2003, and he was on CNN at that time as well with Wolf Blitzer. And, and listen to what Dershowitz said about torture again, because uh, this makes it a little bit more specific. Sometimes we talk about things in the abstract, but he makes it a little bit more specific, and he's comfortable with this. He says, I would talk about non-lethal torture, say, a sterilized needle underneath the nail, which would violate Geneva Accords, but, you know, countries all over the world violate Geneva Accords. They do it secretly and hypothetically, the way the French did in Algeria. If we ever came close to doing it, and we don't know whether this is such a case, I think we would want to do it with accountability and openly, and not adopt the way of the hypocrite. So, evidently, he thinks that just by, you know, openly declaring that they're going to do criminal, immoral, illegal, unconstitutional acts, that that somehow sanctifies it. I mean, that's the kind of uh, arguments we've gotten from Dershowitz in the past. 
Well, and they teach this at uh, Harvard Law School now these days with six professors uh, advocating torture and other professors uh, advocating not only the kangaroo courts on uh, Guantanamo, but that the uh, kangaroo court system on Guantanamo be opened here in the United States of America and mm -hmm. applied to uh, United States citizens. It's it's a real disgrace uh, what, what's going on at Harvard Law School. But Dersh has always been in the uh, forefront of this um, at Harvard Law School after 9-11 and uh, uh, nationwide and indeed uh, uh, inter international. Yes. Uh, there's a couple other things I want to cover here, too, that, that Dershowitz has done. But what you just said here is very important. They're going to take these things that we see being done in Israel against Palestinians that violate human rights and the rule of law and justice and that sort of thing. They're advocating these, these, uh, these policies, these actions over there, and they're getting the United States government to participate in it, these people who are uh, Harvard lawyers or whatever, and they're going to bring that home to America, aren't they? That's correct. And if you have a look, for example, at the uh, National Defense uh, Authorization Act, and, and Obama was after me at uh, uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, he, he knows better. The National Defense Authorization Act from last year, repeated this year, Obama insisted that uh, U.S. citizens uh, living here in the United States, let alone abroad, be included in the NDAA provision permitting the military to uh, uh, pick up and detain and uh, disappear uh, United States uh, citizens uh, into their gulag, uh, whether here in Guantanamo or Afghanistan, uh, or who knows whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, second, we now see uh, under Obama the uh, massive proliferation of drones uh, going to take place uh, in American uh, airspace. And we know for a fact that these uh, droners have already practiced uh, 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 destroying uh, cars on United States highways. It's clear what's coming. They're going to start to uh, uh, arm these drones. Yes, absolutely. Now, going, going you know, back to you know oh. that Obama has uh, his own murder list uh, generated by uh, Brennan. Now he nominated to head the CIA and authorized and approved by his uh, lawyer, Harold Coe, of the now, well, going back to the Yale Law School, taking uh, uh, Rostow's uh, uh, place. Uh, and this uh, murder list, uh, he meets every uh, Tuesday to decide whom he's going to murder, uh, and then uh, sets out murders them, including now three United States uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, this has had me on before. Uh, to criticize uh, President Bush. Well, even President Bush did not irrigate to himself the power uh, to murder United States citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Dershowitz is a big supporter uh, of uh, Obama. Uh, he is a big honcho in the Democratic Party. Indeed, Dershowitz publicly bragged that at the 2008 uh, uh, DNC convention, that nominated uh, Obama to become president the first time, he, Dershowitz, prevented uh, former President Carter uh, from speaking. It, it was his doing, uh, yeah. because President Carter had, had criticized uh, Israel. Now, yeah. I know the last time they did uh, let President Carter uh, have a few words to say, but that was it. So Dershowitz has uh, this influence and this power uh, in the Democratic Party, and with the uh, uh, Obama administration. So he's an extremely uh, uh, dangerous uh, person. There's no question about it. And, and to be clear, the reason why he didn't want Carter to speak is because Carter is, is not, uh, to someone who, like uh, Dershowitz, is an extremist ex uh, Zionist who, who is really pushing these, these policies for, uh, I mean, look at, look at his opposition to Chuck Hagel, for example. He's come out to strongly oppose that because he doesn't think that Chuck Hagel is uh, authoritarian enough uh, on behalf of Israel. And so uh, he just didn't see, uh, you know, Carter giving a green light to anything that Israel wanted to do. So now he's uh, opposing him even within democratic circles. I, I've dealt with uh, Senator Hagel uh, for an hour on a, on a matter. And uh, I, I was impressed with, with the man. That doesn't mean uh, I agree with uh, uh, everything uh, he has to say or he has done. But what really impressed me was his uh, his Senate office uh, 
was littered with uh, pictures of his combat service in Vietnam. Uh, and I would think if he becomes Secretary of Defense, we will see some degree of restraint uh, mm -hmm. exercised on the outright warmongers there, no other word for them, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, White House and the uh, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, certainly the State Department as well under Secretary Clinton. But I don't know about Kerry. Uh, you know, Kerry was a Vietnam veteran himself, and perhaps he will proceed to exercise some, some restraint uh, on, on the rest of this administration. I really don't know what will happen. Well, Dershowitz certainly isn't a voice for restraint. Uh, going back, you mentioned the NDAA. Here, here's Exhibit 2. Now, this is uh, from Homeland Security Affairs, which is a publication of the Navy back in October of 2008. And here's a quote from uh, Dershowitz. He advocated, and the, the title of the article was, Preventive Detention and the War on Terror. Now, this is three years before the NDAA, and this is what... Uh, this is how the article begins. No civilized nation confronting serious danger has ever relied exclusively on criminal convictions for past offenses. Every country has introduced, by one means or another, a system of preventive or administrative detention for persons who are thought to be dangerous, but who might not be convictable under the conventional criminal law. That pretty much sums up the essence of the NDAA, right? If you don't think that you can get a, uh, you're suspicious of somebody, but you don't think that you can convict them, uh, so, you know, you just basically uh, preventively detain them. That's, that's the essence of the NDAA, isn't it? Well, that's correct. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Dershowitz has publicly attacked me for my support of the Palestinians, so I'm sure I'd be near the top of his list to be preventively uh, detained in violation of the Constitution. And now I'm sure that uh, Alex is on his uh, list as well. We have to understand Israel uh, has engaged in this uh, policy of preventive detention against Palestinians, clear-cut violation of the uh, four Geneva Conventions of 1949, uh, war crime. But Britain has as well. Speaking of uh, mm -hmm. Piers Morgan, the Brit nitwit, uh, Britain had uh, uh, pioneered preventive detention uh, including and especially in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, where the uh, Preventive Detention Act is still in effect, though uh, not being uh, applied, but can be uh, resurrected at any time. And we all know the massive abuses that um, preventive detention uh, resulted in in Northern Ireland, including uh, torture uh, of Irish uh, by, by British forces. I've been over there myself and uh, have interviewed and, and documented torture victims, as I have uh, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who were preventively detained and uh, uh, tortured by Israel. So uh, uh, Morgan uh, and, and Dershowitz are two peas in the pod, the uh, British yes. Empire and the Israeli Empire, uh, and their Alex is uh, standing up for the American uh, Republic or what, what remains of it. Yes, yes. And, it, and it's not even uh, even strictly American what we're looking at. I mean, this even goes back to, uh, you know, English law that preceded America. I mean, this, this type of uh, indefinite detention without trial, that goes back to the Star Chamber that they had in England. That, that well, goes back and takes us beyond Magna, you know, the Magna Carta and right to trial by jury. These are things that, you know, even people in Britain uh, had a long tradition of before it came to America. It overturns everything that has basically defined a civil government. That is correct, at least going back to the uh, uh, Magna Carta and the barons dealing with King John and uh, Runnymede, who are, are correct. And unfortunately, uh, after 9-11, uh, and, and this has been documented by Amnesty International, headquartered uh, uh, in London, uh, Tony Blair has effectively turned Britain into a police state. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we need someone like uh, Morgan coming over here and uh, trying uh, to promote these uh, uh, anti-American uh, 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 values. Yes, he, he does have a, a First Amendment right to speak under the U.S. Constitution, but uh, he is uh, being put on television, and uh, television is uh, uh, regulated by the Federal Communications Act. So I think someone uh, should look into that issue. Uh, you know, can uh, CNN put someone out there uh, uh, calling for violations of the 
uh, United States Constitution uh, under the Federal Communications Act. Now, the problem is uh, Obama has effectively gutted uh, any uh, uh, regulation of the FCC by the FCC because all the news media supports him. Yeah. So that's the uh, dilemma we, we are in. Yes, you do have a First Amendment, but when it comes to television, television is not like, like the print. Um, and there are, you know, narrower uh, rules and exceptions applied to television as opposed to uh, print media. Well, and of course, uh, in Britain, uh, a lot of Americans are not familiar with Piers Morgan's past, but in Britain, he kind of made a name for himself running a kind of a National Enquirer type of tabloid paper, and their stock and trade was uh, wiretapping, uh, you know, illegally, uh, celebrities' phones and, you know, breaking into their answer machines and that sort of thing. So, you know, someone like Piers Morgan, who has that kind of a past, I'm sure he's perfectly comfortable with the kind of violations of civil liberties that we see Obama proposing and, in fact, doing with uh, the reauthorization of uh, FISA and, and uh, the Utah data center that's coming online. I mean, they are doing wire, uh, wireless uh, warrantless wiretaps on uh, everybody, not, not just American citizens, everybody in the entire planet, essentially. Uh, remember, Britain does not have a Bill of Rights. I mean, we, we fought a revolution against the British in part for that Bill of Rights, the yes. first amendments to the Constitution, including the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and the Sixth Amendment. Uh, and torture is clearly prohibited by the Eighth Amendment, uh, which uh, Dershowitz has, uh, has called for. And as I said before, uh, the British uh, have certainly practiced in, in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm, exactly. And, and one of the things that, you know, one of the tactics of uh, uh, Piers Morgan and the people who are trying to uh, destroy the Second Amendment at this point is to show the bloody shirt, to show uh, the, the grief of the parents, to show uh, people who've had uh, children that they've lost with these shootings. Yet they never show pictures of uh, victims of Obama's drone assassination campaigns and the fact that they do double tap raids, that they will hit an area, wait for people to rush in to rescue and then hit it a second time. I mean, they're not concerned about collateral damage. They're not concerned about the number of children that they, that they destroy, that they uh, murder and maim. And Piers Morgan is happy to have his picture taken with President Obama, but he thinks that uh, someone who passionately defends our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, is somehow a dangerous person, perhaps dangerous to his power base. And this is something I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Back in November 15th, this last uh, November 15th, in the New York Times, Dershowitz uh, authored an, an article called The Rule of Proportionality. Let me read to you from that a quote here. He says, it's sometimes argued that targeted assassination should never be permitted because it's a form of extrajudicial killing. This view is absurd. And he says, the alternatives to targeted killing are either to allow terrorists free reign in targeting civilians or to engage in under-targeted military actions that are likely to cause more casualties. Well, that's clearly not true. That's the, the uh, false dichotomy that was presented to Ron Paul by uh, uh, Newt Gingrich and others who said, you know, you're either going to preemptively arrest and torture people or we're going to have a nuclear bomb in a city. And as Rand Paul has pointed out, and as we all know, there have been people who have been accused of being terrorists who've had their day in court. They've been convicted. Other people have been accused of being terrorists and had their day in court and been uh, exonerated. Uh, but they don't want us to have that sort of thing. They, they approve of Obama's uh, targeted assassination lists, which we see his, his longtime approval of, as you said, in Israel. Right. Even Amnesty International has uh, condemned uh, the uh, targeted assassination uh, as extraditional uh, executions. And as a matter of fact, um, and I, I spent four years on the board of uh, Amnesty International USA, and then uh, U.S. Army Field Manual 2710, the Laws of Land Warfare, that is still uh, valid and binding uh, on U.S. Armed Forces, including President Obama as Commander-in-Chief, uh, prohibits uh, assassination. And in fact, that prohibition in U.S. Army Field Manual today goes all the way back to uh, President Lincoln's uh, General Orders Number 100 issued during the U.S. Civil War, uh, prohibiting uh, assassination outright and saying it was nothing better, it was nothing more than uh, uh, murder uh, and pure uh, barbarism. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if President Lincoln uh, prohibited during the uh, Civil War, and that has been U.S. policy 
uh, since 18, April of uh, 1863, uh, I think it, it's been in there for good cause, and it should be in there for good cause. And as I said, uh, murder and assassination um, also violates the uh, U.S. War Crimes Act. So we have uh, Dershowitz uh, advocating war crimes and President Obama himself uh, 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 committing uh, war crimes. And indeed, when uh, war crimes such as this are widespread or systematic, and in this case, they are both, and the latest figure is Obama's probably murdered 176 children, uh, they become crimes uh, against humanity, which in terms of severity uh, come after, at, at the top of the list, crimes against peace, then genocide and crimes against humanity, just to give you uh, an idea of the uh, the severity uh, of, of this offense. And he's murdering U.S. citizens, and indeed, he sent his attorney general, uh, Holder, who has just op uh, opted in, uh, upped up for more time as attorney general, out to Northwestern Law School to publicly advocate and support murdering United States citizens. Mm -hmm. And the faculty at Northwestern Law School knew full well that that is why Holder was coming out there to explain and try to justify the Obama policy of murdering U.S. citizens. They invited him out there to, to do this. And when Holder got at Northwestern Law School, even though they knew full well what he was going to stay, say, they gave him a standing ovation before he spoke and after he spoke. Mm. Now, that shows you how rotten, corrupt, and despicable uh, uh, American legal education has become after 9-11 under the influence of people like Dershowitz and Harvard Law School. Yale Law School, which has just hired uh, Harold Kobach, uh, he'll be returning. He has justified the murder and assassination of drone policy uh, for uh, uh, for Obama. Indeed, Co is the only uh, lawyer for Obama who would publicly uh, testify in favor of his unconstitutional war uh, against Libya. No one else would do it. Just uh, uh, just Co. Um, and indeed, the uh, Association of American Law Schools that represents every uh, law school of law professor in America just had co speak at their uh, annual conference uh, in New Orleans and gave their keynote address on uh, globalization and the law. Uh, I didn't bother going. Uh, why would I dignify listening to uh, uh, a war criminal? Uh, who has justified Obama's drone strikes up to and including murdering United States citizens. It, yeah. it, 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 really is, it really is frightening. And as you say, these law schools, these professors who are advocating these types of uh, any, any means justifies their ends as they define their ends. And, and I just want the American public to understand that people who have uh, advocated this type of criminal uh, activity abroad and carried it out, that they have absolutely no uh, compunction about coming to the United States and doing the same thing against American citizens. We have now the people in suits and ties who are now advocating these types of, of uh, criminal actions and calling themselves lawyers. We're going to see this type of thing come here. And I just hope that people on the left who value civil liberties, because there are a lot of people on the left who value civil liberties, but they just don't understand the Second Amendment. I would hope that they would understand that the same people who advocate torture, who advocate indefinite detention without trial, who advocate extrajudicial killings and murder lists and assassinations from the air, I would hope that they would not want to give a monopoly of force to the people who do this. You know, it, it was, in my understanding, the Second Amendment, and we can read the founders and see they were afraid, as you said before, of governments that uh, violate individual liberties. And, you know, the idea that uh, the, the citizenry would be armed was set up to be a check against that. Well, certainly if, if you uh, read the Second Amendment, that's what it says, uh, part of a well-regulated militia. Uh, there, there it is, and the militias were uh, there to protect the uh, peoples of the state. Indeed, it uh, one point, there were 16 
uh, state constitutions that guaranteed the right of everyone living in those states uh, to uh, wage revolution uh, against the uh, state government if they uh, uh, should become uh, tyrannical. Uh, that is no longer the case today. Uh, uh, the powers that be, given <laughs> the increasing uh, conservatism of the American empire, have uh, slowly gotten rid of uh, most of those state constitutions. But at one point, there were 16 states of the Union that did guarantee the right of the people to wage a uh, uh, revolution against their own state governments in the event that, that they became uh, uh, tyrannical. Yes, yes. And as you've, you pointed out and others have pointed out, Alex Jones has said it, Ron Paul has said it, every empire eventually turns in on itself and destroys the republic. And we have, under the uh, advocacy of people like uh, Dershowitz, who have advocated our imperial stances and our you know, foreign policy and that sort of thing, we've seen all these kinds of human rights abuses, illegal activity. They've not only tolerated it, but advocated it. And now we're going to see that kind of thing happen here. And one of the few deterrents to that is an armed citizenry. And uh, the armed citizenry does not have to, uh, as Jefferson said, the beauty of the Second Amendment is you only need it when they come to take it away. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we have not had to, to, uh, to use that. And, and they're an, a wonderful deterrent to force as long as the people own them. They're a deterrent, and uh, I would hate to see that taken away. Well, we're out of time, but I really do appreciate you giving us a real legal perspective on, uh, on real civil liberties, and I appreciate your standing and your advocacy for uh, human rights, not just for Americans, but for, for uh, Palestinians, for people all over the world. Uh, you know, when we, when we give up on other people, we give up on ourselves as well. Well, that's correct. And one thing uh, history teaches us is that uh, uh, if the United States government gets away of uh, violating the civil rights, civil liberties, human rights of uh, what, what we call aliens, foreigners. Uh, it's only a question of time before they turn it against the uh, American people themselves. Yes. It's only a question of time. History teaches this. And so uh, we have to stand up for ourselves, uh, as well as uh, uh, people in other countries who are uh, being subjected by, uh, to uh, illegal and oftentimes criminal policies by, by our own government. Well, and unfortunately, uh, Dershowitz certainly has always been on, on the other side of these issues. Yes, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you, Francis Boyle, for being on the right side and for standing up and uh, doing it with clarity. Thank you very much for being our guest today. Well, thank you. And please give my uh, best regards to Alex. We will do. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, we've got another interview coming up here with us is uh, Rob Dew talking to Professor James Tracy from Florida Atlantic University. Now, Professor Tracy has an interesting perspective on Sandy Hook and some things that he believes just don't add up. And we'll be right back after this quick break. I really enjoy it when the globalists try to poison us and, uh, well, we resist them via a free market system. Hello, my fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here, introducing you to the Pro Pure family of gravity fed filters. Now, you know that the globalists are filling our water with radioactive isotopes, fluoride, lead, mercury, arsenic. And one of the few systems that can efficiently and economically remove or reduce down to non detectable levels these poisons are gravity fed filters. And Pro Pure is the top of the line. Their filters are impregnated with silver, a natural antibiotic. On top of that, they're bigger, so they filter faster. You don't have to prime these the first time you use them. It's amazing. Go to InfoWars.com and click on the shopping cart link uh, to see the entire family of these babies. Now, the fluoride they add to our water is so tiny that most filters can't cut it out, but ProPure has their system that will, again, reduce it to non-detectable levels, almost get all of it out of there. That's also available. And if you look at the different systems they offer, the Pro Pure Big Brush Finish is on a stand, so it's easier on a table or at your restaurant or wherever you have it to go up with a glass or a mug and fill it up. Then there's this big baby right here, the Pro Pure King Large version. Got a lot of different options that come with it. Also, they have the Pro Pure Big, probably one of the best values out there. And of course, it's burnished stainless steel. And then what I use on my 
my RV, something that's great for your hunting cabin or the back porch, is the Pro Pure Traveler. Small and portable, but packs a huge punch, cleans out all that garbage. They also have a glass sight spigot, so you don't have to take the top off and look in the bottom area to see how much water. You can see how fast it's filtering with this optional uh, system. The globalists obviously are hitting us through our water. It's time to take control of our lives. It's time to not give our children and families these poisons. And these systems cut it down to non-detectable levels across the board. ProPure is the name. I only promote what I believe in. And I use ProPure in my home and my office. And I recommend that you check out the information on ProPure at InfoWars.com. We already have the lowest price at InfoWars.com on the ProPure Gravity Filter System. But when you add in the 10% off when InfoWarriors use the product code WATER at InfoWars.com, nobody can top it. So again, it's a win-win-win. Stop drinking the poison water. Uh, checkmate the globalists when it comes to your health and support InfoWars.com and the work we're doing here. You know, many revolutionaries rob banks and things and kidnap people for funds. We promote in the free market the products we use that are about preparedness. That's how we fund this revolution against the New World Order in our move to restore our constitutional republic and a spirit of 1776 worldwide. Check it out at InfoWars.com. Pro Pure, top of the line, number one, most powerful and effective and economical gravity fed water system in the world. Pro Pure, available, discounted at InfoWars.com. Don't forget product code WATER to save 10%. It's the latest generation, years in development. Pro Pure is the name. Alex Jones here with a message that could revolutionize health in this country. Going back about a year and a half ago, I began to learn about the incredible health effects of Longevity products. Aaron Dykes lost 92 pounds. We're going to show you some before and afters. Aaron, break down what happened, your story. I've worked really hard with diet and exercise to try to lose weight, but I just didn't get the results. It just didn't happen. Then I saw what you were doing with InfoWarsTeam.com. I wasn't even trying to lose weight, but I got it because I wanted to feel better energy. I wanted that nutrition. Didn't even understand how that could kickstart my own weight loss goals. But the products did that for me. I found myself suddenly losing weight, more energetic, wanting to exercise, wanting to eat the right foods. And they don't even advertise it as weight loss. I want to challenge our radio listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com. Sign up as a distributor and get wholesale pricing discounts at InfoWarsTeam.com. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Rob Dew. Uh, you just saw David Knight doing the news and interviewing Francis Boyle. Well, I've been trying to get a hold of James Tracy uh, for a few days now. He is author of several articles that you could go to if you go to memoryholeblog.com. He's got four articles there concerning the Sandy Hook massacre. Um, Mr. Tracy is the man who's come out. You might have seen the Daily Mail articles. He's basically disputing the uh, events. In fact, here's the Mail Online, Newtown official furious after Florida professor makes outrageous conspiracy claims saying that Sandy Hook shooting may have not happened. And I don't believe he's saying it may have not happened. What he's saying is that it did not, it most likely did not happen in the way the media is portraying it. And we're going to go over some of that evidence now. He's going to be on uh, Alex's radio show on Wednesday, so be 
looking out for that. He has a PhD from the University of Iowa, and he currently teaches at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, one of his uh, courses is called Culture of Conspiracy. I would have definitely been taking that in the 90s when I was in college. And uh, we turn now to James Tracy. How you doing, James? Fine, thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Um, your recent post, Sandy Hook Massacre Timeline, I, I've barely even got into this, although I see that you, you mentioned my report that I did uh, last year. But what, what caught my attention was the... The Sandy Hook School Massacre, Unanswered Questions and Missing Information, which starts off with a quote from Wayne Carver II, the medical examiner. Why don't we, let's start there with that. And I actually have a video clip I want to go to, uh, which, which talks about the, the different guns that were found. But uh, what can you tell us about Wayne Carver and what is so peculiar about his uh, press conference that day that a lot of people have been putting on the Internet and making issue of? I think this is one of the main things that one really has to scrutinize with regard to the uh, Newtown tragedy. Uh, here is an individual, the chief pathologist of the state of Connecticut. He uh, has 33 years of experience. He's highly experienced uh, in his uh, in his profession and yet he is at a loss with regard to actually being able to describe uh, what uh, took place in this uh, mass uh, post-mortem that he presided over on the night of December 14th and the early morning hours of December 15th. Uh, there are very simple things that cannot be answered by him such as for example uh, the where the uh, where the bullet where the injuries the bullet holes are uh, uh, on the uh, on the bodies uh, how many bullets uh, were uh, were recovered uh, what positions were the uh, victims in uh, that were recovered he either hedged and, and could not uh, answer uh, these things or he deferred to the uh, state police uh, who were uh, flanking him uh, and uh, and uh, and accompanying him during the press conference and I think that the reporters also became rather suspicious as well because uh, as the as the press conference concludes their questions become more and more simplistic uh, and uh, he could not really respond so for example how many boys and how many girls were killed he couldn't answer how many boys and how many girls there were. Uh, he, you know, there were 20, but he couldn't answer how many girls, uh, how many boys, the proportion. Uh, so these were things that really made me wonder when I looked more closely at, at the footage itself and actually began to transcribe it. Uh, it became more and more odd, uh, and again, I think that uh, most likely the, the reporters were uh, aware of this, but. As is often the case, unfortunately, our public discourse is determined to a large degree by sound bites, by headlines, and one of the things that came out of that press conference of the headlines was three to 11 bullets per victim. Well, he was talking about the victims that he was specifically examining, which were seven of the uh, 20 uh, of, of the 28 victims overall. Uh, so even that is not accurate, and that, yet that is something that the uh, internet, the national international media, took and ran with uh, and uh, made a fact when it, when it was not really a fact at all. Right, and and you made the point in your uh, post that if, if that was the case, you you average seven bullets per individual, excluding misses. He shot around a, about 182 times or once every two seconds and you know this with 30 round magazines how many times is he changing those out if he was indeed the only shooter making that many shots getting that many hits uh, overall a guy, a guy who had no military training right as exactly. far as, as far as we know and he was in there, uh, we est I estimate, about five to seven minutes. So he had to change those clips a uh, total of five or six times. Uh, and uh, it seems, uh, it, it seems some somewhat unlikely uh, that, uh, that he would have been able to do that, that he would have been that proficient. Uh, there's also the matter on a related note of the amount of ammunition that he had on, on his person when he entered the, uh, the facility, uh, as, as well as the... Uh, the, 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 the the garb that he that he had on. Uh, this individual is only about 115 or 120 pounds, uh, and so is an awful lot of material to actually uh, to actually have uh, in order to, uh, to and and to, to sustain oneself and to carry out an, an act uh, such as that. Right, and I, I want to go to this video clip now. We have it starts off with an NBC News reporter 
saying he got this information from the officials, several state and federal officials is what he mentioned, and that they found four handguns on Adam Lanza's body. And then it goes to uh, the coroner saying all the shots are done with the long rifle. And, and actually before that, it shows the cops at the back end of a car. They're trying to eject more shells out of it several times, but you actually see one shell come out. It's definitely not a shotgun because they don't work like that. But let's, let's roll this clip real quick and then we'll have you comment on that. Mm -hmm. There is some new information this morning from a couple of federal officials um, and state officials. They say now that uh, there were actually four handguns uh, recovered inside the school, not just two, as we were initially told. Four handguns, and apparently only handguns, that were taken into the school. We knew that uh, Adam Lanza, the man said to be the gunman here, also had a assault-style, AR-15-style rifle that he had taken to the school that was in the car he drove there, his mother's car. But we've been told by several officials that he left that in the car. Everybody, uh, death was caused by, uh, everyone that we've completed so far was caused by gunshot wounds. Uh, all the wounds that I know of at this point were caused by the, uh, the, long, the long weapon. Yes. So there, there the medical examiner says they were all caused by the long rifle. You've got... The news reporter saying four handguns were found. And while he was talking, I actually put over that because I made this video piece. Um, the shot of the black car where the officer is pulling out a rifle and ejecting uh, at least one cartridge out of it right there. So did you, did you actually see that piece of video? It's, a, it's kind of an overhead shot uh, at night. Yes, I did. I did see that, and I think I included that. I may have included that in the timeline. I'm pretty sure it's been about a week or so uh, since I since I worked on that. Uh, but uh, I think I'm pretty sure that that is in fact included. And uh, when the reporter at the press conference, I believe it's that passage that you played, when he asked, uh, when he stated that the the, the rifle was uh, found in the trunk, uh, the um, Paul Vance, Lieutenant Paul Vance from the Connecticut State Police interceded and said, that's not correct, sir. That's not correct, sir. So at that point, I believe that is when the narrative changed from the handguns to the rifles, the assault style rifles. I believe that that may very well be what uh, what future legislation, uh, gun control legislation will uh, will target. And so uh, consequently, the narrative uh, changed. Well, it became demonized after that. It was the Bushmaster that they were demonizing. So whose, whose car were they removing this gun out of, this rifle that was supposedly used in the killings, but the guy killed himself in the school? So how did he get the rifle back into the trunk of his car? I'm, I'm confused at this point. I think that most everyone should be, and it goes right back to the major news media. Why are they not scrutinizing these inconsistencies? Uh, th that to me is a uh, well. It's it, it's not a mystery, but uh, it, it it certainly is an indictment to a certain degree on uh, with regard to their complicity uh, in this in uh, in weaving this overall narrative. Well, I was getting emails from from a listener who said he actually went to the Starbucks where all the AP reporters and reporters have been hanging out, and he showed them the report that I did that you referenced in um, I believe your first uh, writing, uh, talking about the second and third shooter how uh, the, the little kid saw somebody on the ground, which I believe now was probably a father of one of the students. That one of those guys has been kind of explained away as a father who was detained briefly in handcuffs. And then, uh, you know, we go to the overhead video shot and we do have that video, you can pull it up, and it's the, the cops around a guy in the woods. And then we have testimony of another witness who says they brought the guy out of the woods. He was wearing camo and black pants and he's over there in the car, in fact. Look right over there, and you know, why don't the cameras swing around and shoot this guy, you know, and get a shot of him? Let's let's see, well, you know, why don't they do that? They did walk a guy out of the woods. I saw him walk a guy out earlier with handcuffs. He walked by us and said he didn't do it. It was a grown man. A grown man. Yeah, he's sitting in the front of the police car over there now. So I mean, he didn't have a gun. No, I didn't see any gun. Just had him handcuffed, and he walked by us and looked into parents' eyes and said I didn't do it. How was he dressed? Uh, camo pants with a dark jacket. And not only that, but as you pointed out in that report, he was in the front seat of the cruiser. Yeah. So if he was a suspect, why would he be in the front seat? 
It made me question whether or not this may have been uh, some sort of a, of a drill or the equivalent. I mean, that's one way to, uh, to explain it, because I'm quite certain that he, at that time, identified himself uh, to them to get that sort of special treatment. Uh, we don't know what took place also because of the, the audio from the 9-11 dispatch is scrambled at key points. And I believe they're at points where these individuals' names are identified. That's yeah. my theory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with regard to the individual who was uh, prone down in the park in the parking lot, as well as the individual in the uh, up in the uh, in the woods. Now, also there were there were a couple of individuals in the woods, and there's a, a, a good uh, YouTube video that actually points out how there was another individual uh, suspect, I believe, behind a tree, and you have to look quite closely. But it's in the upper left-hand portion of the screen where you see an, an individual who comes out from behind a tree. It's rather eerie, and it's it's difficult. You, you can't really make it out, but I'm I'm quite certain that uh, that it is a um, it's it's a it's a human figure silhouette. And I, and I believe there's another Paul Vance clip, Lieutenant Vance clip, where he says. You know, we're not going to talk about individuals that we may have found uh, chopping wood in in the woods or not. You know, uh, and it, it it comes kind of out of nowhere because um, you hear a reporter ask one question, and there's a slight reporter, and I think he's looking at the other reporter asking the question that you can't hear, and then he talks about the the wood chopping incident. But what what's interesting is that the the uh, listener had seen my report, went and asked the AP guy. The AP guy had no knowledge of it, and then a couple weeks later, he sends him the article about the father of uh, one of the students who was there, and which makes sense, um, you know, because at least one child saw that guy uh, laid out on the ground. Um, I, I want to go now to your timeline, which I haven't even really got through. I got through like three pages, and it's it's a long sucker. I mean, it's uh, you know, thirty something pages long here. The Sandy Hook massacre timeline. Uh, why don't we go through this? What are the, the biggest things that jump out to you in this timeline? Well, it might be uh, that many pages long because of the comments that have been left on it as well by um, by folks visiting the blog over the past few days. I wish it were that detailed. Uh, I, uh, I sat down to do something along the lines of what Paul Thompson did, uh, you know, I think a wonderful public service following 9-11 when he created his 9-11 uh, his timeline that eventually became a book. Uh, because really, uh, the, the the news media often do, they, they usually report important material, but they fail to put it in context. So I, I just sought to actually put uh, put things in context, attempt to do that, because there were so many conflicts in the uh, uh, in the information and, and and the overall narrative that came out was something quite quite apart from what uh, what the sum of I think the reports should have actually been. Uh, I can't I can't think of any immediately off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to discuss any of them. I guess let's go to that picture that from the uh, new was it the Newtown B? I'm going to go to this picture that was yeah. released as the kids holding hands. It's that famous picture that was put out 10:47 a.m. on December 14th. Famous photo taken by Newtown B editor, distributed via CBS and other national media, um, and 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 you said you found testimony where she said she took was taking pictures as fast as she could, and yet we've seen this is the only picture we've seen of hers. Yeah, I'm not sure if she was actually able to to enter the building, but there was an exchange between her and the chief editor of the paper. Uh, I think his name is Frank Volkert, and he's the one that wrote the first story of the of the event itself. So uh, this individual that takes the pictures uh, changes into her uh, her firefighter outfit and joins the uh, first responders while the editor goes into the the uh, building and apparently supposedly interviews the uh, the principal of the the, uh, of, of Sandy Hook, uh, Don Hawksbrock. Who was already shot dead. Supposedly. Right. Uh, that, that came out in an initial report, and then yeah. they had to retract it. And uh, and then a few days later, even more seriously revised the uh, the report itself. That's something I, I don't believe that I included in the timeline, even though it would have been fitting. And, and a couple of readers actually pointed that out to me, but that is covered uh, in another article. But it's interesting how they're only... Now, she was taking pictures, she says, 
you know, constantly as, as she's uh, following the, the police cruisers and so forth into the facility. So that's a long driveway. Uh, it's a big parking lot. So I would imagine uh, if she knows her, how to, you know, how to photograph. She must have taken maybe three, four, five dozen pictures. We only see two of them, one of which really makes uh, the national, you know, the, the national spotlight. Uh, so that's rather odd at a time when it, the national news media, the international news media that are coming in to Newtown are really, really hungry, voraciously hungry for uh, imagery, right? There's no shortage of that with regard to the mourners and uh, with regard to, I'm not saying the mourners, but those, the pedestrians and so forth in the in the aftermath, uh, those that were shocked and traumatized and so forth. But here's a very crucial uh, point in time, uh, you know, on the school grounds. We haven't seen really any photography of, of, of the school grounds. And uh, we don't see it here with the exception of the, the uh, parking lot itself and uh, the, the evacuation of the students. Only 15 or 16 students, 16 students at the most, rather than, uh, rather than the 600 or so uh, students who were there. And even though there is aerial coverage, because that is what uh, the Associated Press uh, aerial coverage captured the uh, shooters, the shooters who, uh, at least the one shooter who had absconded uh, into the woods, there is no coverage of the uh, evacuation itself en masse from the school. So that's uh, it struck me as being rather unusual because you would think an event of this magnitude, uh, that chopper, if, if not more choppers, were, would have been in the air for the entire day uh, or much of the day attempting to get footage. We do see footage of, for example, the SWAT team showing up mm -hmm. and, and examining the grounds and things like that. SWAT team on the roofs of the school? Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, but it's as if they're, you know, they're uh, running around a vacant building. Not saying they necessarily are, but there's little, if any, proof of that. And also something that I think some uh, some uh, independent researchers had uh, uh, presented on a YouTube uh, video. Uh, they were pointing out how the uh, the vehicles around the fire station uh, were located, you know, to to kind of get them all within the within the crop. Uh, and yet there is uh, there, there's not a great deal of activity outside of the fire station. You would think there would be an outpouring of people uh, uh, coming out of that uh, that fire station between uh, uh, 600 or so uh, students and at least 600 parents. You're talking over mm -hmm. a thousand. I think that's got to be a fairly modest facility. It's just for the Sandy Hook vicinity of Newtown. So, uh, you know, you're talking about maybe a couple of uh, uh, a couple of trucks uh, maybe to, to be able to fit in there. Maybe a few more, but still, it's fairly modest probably. Right. Where are you going to put 600 students in that firehouse, which if you look at an overhead map, you can see where it is in relationship to a school. There's a long road, uh, kind of a curvy road that goes up to that firehouse, and you would think it would take a while to get 600 students up there, and, and if the media did have that imagery, they would be showing it over and over again if it existed, if that event ever took place. And I, I've got another clip I want to go to, and it is of, what, what gets me, there is an article that lands a blast his way through the front door. This mm -hmm. All this, how he shot his way through because people were saying, well, if there's a security system installed, how did he get in? You know, that was a, a, a big thing because they just installed this big security system that, yeah. you know, the only way to get in was through a key card or, or some way to get in to, to the building. And he shot his way through, yet we see no pictures of, of this doorway that was shot, shot up. Uh, no broken glass, no bullet holes, nothing. The only thing you get are aerial photos or diagrams, which we saw a lot of diagrams during Oklahoma City when they wanted to talk about a giant crater that this truck bomb created. I remember that specifically in Newsweek magazine, which you can't find anymore on the web. I searched for it for a long time. But right. there was, a, and, and the official report actually, there's a diagram of the crater that the truck bomb left, but no actual yeah. photos of, of any such crater. So we have the same thing with this, this mysterious doorway that was shot up that may or may not exist as, as, as well. On, on a related note, uh, this is a brand new uh, uh, security uh, system. Sandy Hook is quite an affluent area, and I would think that the people there in the school district would not, uh, you know, they wouldn't think twice about spending and getting the best security system in the world. Now, such a security system has ubiquitous and constant video surveillance. That is captured. That is recorded. Now, where is that video surveillance? That's right. uh, that's a very very good question. That's, and and as is the point with regard to Oklahoma City, if uh, the federal government would have revealed uh, would would. Uh, 
present uh, that video evidence, uh, a lot of uh, questions would be uh, would be resolved. Exactly, especially of, of a John Doe number two. Have you had any other attacks other than what, what I've, I've seen out in the media? Have you been getting any threats or? or well, I think that about, um, I would say about three quarters of the comments on the blog that I've gone through, and I can't read every one, but I do look at uh, the, the tone uh, and, and so forth. I, I think about 75% uh, are positive, if not more. Uh, and the same with regard to emails. I've gotten some emails from a handful of colleagues who have, uh, you know, really uh, sent their support and, uh, and, and really appreciate, uh, say they appreciate appreciate uh, what what uh, what I'm attempting to address here uh, so overall I think that it's been positive there have been negative ones but that uh, that is to be expected and one has to question how many of those are actually paid trolls uh, who uh, who might be dispatched by uh, one um, one party or another? We I don't I don't really know. Some of them seem so so illogical, but I include those as well because they illustrate, uh, in fact, uh, how 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 silly uh, you know uh, questioning such an inquiry, uh, a request for such an inquiry actually is. Well, and and at the bottom line. Let's see the footage of him blasting his way in. And, you know, I don't need to see anything gory. I don't need to see anything. But let's actually see this guy dressed up, you know, a as, a, as a special forces uh, soldier, you know, kicking his way in like Rambo. Let let's just see that. And then. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that a good percentage of the public do not see this in a broader historical context. Uh, pronouncements from uh, from political leaders and uh, and so forth, and even uh, you know fairly noteworthy celebrities such as Bob Costas. Uh, th this uh, is this is within a larger sort of trajectory. We just can't look at uh, Newtown in isolation. Uh, it's a tragedy. There's no doubt about it. But it cannot be looked at in isolation. If there's going to be a debate with regard to gun control, there needs to be a, a, a debate that is rational and that not is not tinged by emotion or anything of the like. And I think that is exactly what is attempted to be. It's, that, that is attempted uh, here in, in, with regard to this, uh, this incident. I totally agree with you. Thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you again next week. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Rob. All right. Well, you could check out his class at Florida Atlantic University, Culture of Conspiracy. That was per, uh, Ph.D. James Tracy, and very interesting guy. Um, he's, you know, got a couple of reports I did listed in his uh in his report, so it's good to see that people are communicating on this level because, you know, uh, the mainstream media is not writing anything about this. They just would wish everybody take the narrative that they spoon feed us and, you know, they show us the few clips over and over again and that we're just going to take it and let them take our guns because, you know, one crazy person probably on meds went went nuts. But we'll, uh, time will tell and, and we'll see what will happen. There's there's a few more things. I've been getting emails like crazy from people, and I really do appreciate all your emails. I check them out. Uh, I can't verify or deny some things, so I don't go with it. But I, I do appreciate everybody sending stuff out and at least questioning the narrative out there. So with that, that's our show tonight. If uh, you're watching this on YouTube, please consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. Uh, right now we have a special, $39.95 a month, and you can share that passcode with up to 11 people at the same time. And, uh, you know, we've got plenty of Piers Morgan versus Alex Jones coverage on there, along with all the aftermath that's going on. It's, it's going to be quite a year, I can tell you. It's already starting off with, with, a, with a bang, yeah, so to speak. So with that, I'm Rob Dew. It's the InfoWars Nightly News, and we'll see you again tomorrow.